Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey, friends, Steve Keating. Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that Team has supported this particular podcast, and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us. And they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia Podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their, uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic. And I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can get patients calls they can check on uh describing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things particularly in the myopia community it's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things checking on those myopic patients seeing how they're doing and giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk consider higher team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. I am stoked to get to be joined by my good friend, Jeff Walleen, who uh, I think he's a hero in the myopia world, been doing so much research over the years, answered so many questions over the years. We are uh, broadcasting from the Vision by Design meeting 2023. The Vision by Design meeting 2024 is gonna be held in Dallas October 2nd through the 5th. So if you are listening to this, make sure that you are getting ready to attend that meeting. You can check out the details at the uh, AAOMC's website. Jeff, yes. what is going on in your life these days? What are you up to? Uh, having a whole lot of fun, and most of it is around myopia, it seems like. Um, but what we're trying to do is delay the onset of myopia by um, providing children with atropine. Mm. So low concentration atropine. There have been some studies that have shown some promise, but we really need to sh do some of these studies in North America to see if it's going to be as beneficial for North American children as it is um, for yeah. children in Asia. You've got a potentially gigantic study that uh, you're looking to start in the next couple of years. Tell us a little bit about how this all came about and what the process is to go through this. Yeah, well, you know, we're always looking for the next important question that needs to be answered. And this is one that sort of floated to the top. I think it's a completely new way to go about trying to reduce the ramifications of myopia ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, we are now slowing the progression of myopia, but maybe we can treat myopia before it even onsets. And then that way, when it does onset, we immediately apply some sort of treatment. So yeah. not only do we get the before myopia, but immediate treatment. And so children aren't experiencing that period of early fast eye growth um, without any sort of control. Yeah, I guess a kind of a question that some people might have is, if they don't have myopia yet, are we just going to give atropine to everybody? Like, who are the people that potentially would fit into this category? Yeah, and I think that's an important reason for, for important question for two reasons. One is, what can we give these children? Because there are things that slow the progression of myopia. But I don't think really some of these optical treatments make sense, for example, contact lenses, because they don't need the optical treatment. Right. So, right. you know, whatever we can do that's easiest for the patient, that's probably just take a drop of, of atropine, that's beneficial. Mm -hmm. The other potentially easy thing we can do is shove children outside. Yeah. But we literally have to do that. We've, it's, studies have shown that educating parents about the benefits of outdoor time 
doesn't really help them. Um, yeah. In other words, it doesn't make the children go outdoors more. The way those studies have been beneficial is by forcing kids to go outside at recess. Yeah. So it's going to take some public health intervention for that right. to work. Right. So I think that's sort of why atropine is the thing to do um, in terms of delaying the onset of myopia. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, atropine is also important because there is some evidence to show that it does work. And yeah. I think that's really ultimately important. Yeah. So, you know, I, I recently uh, talked to a parent and I told them, you know, what you need to do is you just need to lock the door mm -hmm. and don't let your kid back in. But you you bring up a good point. It's it, it's it's difficult in those in those areas. Kids are so busy after school with different activities and so forth yeah. that they're not getting outside. You know, I think about my kids. Sometimes it's raining in Seattle in the wintertime and they don't go outside for recess. Right. right. They go into the gym, which isn't the same. Right. How do we get those kids outdoors? You know, some 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 people may say that uh, you know how can you tell if somebody's going to become myopic, and 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 maybe you know this better than I do, but there are indications that you know sometimes axial length will will speed up before refractive outcomes get there, and so we can see some of those and predict who may be becoming myopic. Is that yeah. part of this too? No, really, the best predictor of whether or not somebody's become going to become myopic is their refractive error. Yeah. So even these longitudinal measures don't seem to do as good of a job. Um, the CLEAR study actually looked at a number of factors, 11 or 12 factors that were related to the onset of myopia. When they combined them all, eight of them still fit the model, but the refractive error alone predicted as well as all eight of those combined. Yep. So if we just look at, at the refractive error, and for example, if you're six years old and you're between plus 075 and not yet myopic, um, then you are more likely to become myopic. And it's about an 80% chance. So we can predict fairly well who's going to become myopic just by measuring the refractive yeah, error. Yeah, yeah. So we can still do this in everyday practice with a ferropter, right? Absolutely. And maybe a cycloplegic exam, right? That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, you and I have been in the same camp in that what may slow people down from getting into myopia management is the lack of availability of biometry mm -hmm. in everyday practice. We've got machines, you know, from Topcon and Oculus and others that are now fitting into practices because they're an auto refractor plus or they're a topographer plus. But you know, five years from now, we're still not gonna have biometers in everyday practice and really still doing treatment based on refractive air in everyday practice is one of the best ways we're gonna be able to make myopia mainstream. And I love the fact that you bring up the study with regards to the predictors, but also where kids should be. I, I want your perspective on this because I preach and preach and preach on this. You have that kid who's a plus a quarter and is six years old. And so many of our colleagues are saying, well, let's just see. Let's see what happens. And we'll see if it continues to progress over the next couple of years. Are we at a point where we don't have to wait and see? Do we know what's gonna happen in most cases? Yeah, I, I think we really are there. There's data to show that if you are that plus a quarter at that young of a, an age, then you are very likely to become myopic. And when it's a treatment that has very few side effects, then you know we might over treat by 20%, mm -hmm. but it's you know the, the side effects are so low that I really don't think we're hurting a large number of children. And honestly, there is an expense to it, and it's not going to be covered by insurance, but it is relatively inexpensive. So that's what we look at in terms of you know, trying to prevent things. We looked at the, at the cost and the side effects of the treatment, and both of those are pretty favorable, actually, for low concentration atropine. So I think you know, there's a lot of promise, and we can yeah. find the children who do that. Yeah. But speaking of that, yeah. Finding the children is actually the difficult part because these pre-myops don't come to our practices right. for eye examination. So we aren't actually doing manifest refractions on them very often. Mm -hmm. They usually come in when they start having problems. So one of the things we have to do is either change the mindset of, you know, maybe myopic parents, you need to bring your child in early before the onset of myopia, 
or we need to go out and find those myopes. And that's one of the things we've been finding difficult yeah. lately. So in Ohio, you quite possibly have the best program in the country for screenings and educating kids and parents. Can you just briefly talk a little bit about that and, and how, how that advocacy for eye exams is so big? Oh yeah, absolutely. So we do do programs. We've educated over 1.6 million children, wow. you know, pre-K through eighth grade about the importance of routine eye care. Um, and it's a really hard outcome to actually measure the outcomes, sure. but you know, it, it, reaching that many people and the goal is always to get the message home to their parents. So we're working on that as well. Um, but you know, it's still a really difficult thing to do um, in terms of getting people to understand the importance of routine eye care before they're actually having problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the best way we can do it is to talk to the myopic parents and say, because you're myopic, your children is more likely, so we should just do one examination at school age. That'll give us a good indicator of you know, how likely your child is to become nearsighted in the future, and then once they sort of cross that threshold, we could potentially begin treating them if yeah. necessary. So, you know, as you look to try to make a gigantic dent in this myopic universe, right? So we have to get practitioners on board so that when parents are on board, they're ready for this. Like yeah. this is a major undertaking. I'm overwhelmed thinking about it, right. but that's the beauty about researchers is you like say, okay, we're gonna set a plan here. How do you see this all on a grand scale? I'm sure you're saying it's not just you, but on a grand scale over the next five years, us making, uh, and, and, and I know the research won't fully be out because of the atropine studies and so forth in the next five years are gonna be coming up, but five or 10 years, how do we start making these dents in the practitioner as well as in the parents and the kids nationwide yeah. or globally, yeah. right? Well, I, honestly, I always see my job as providing the evidence that doctors can put into practice the very next day, the very next patient they see. So yep. that's always my goal. But I'm not the one educating the doctors. You're the one educating mm -hmm. the doctor. So, um, you know, it's the work that you do that I think is really ultimately important for helping people to know. Sure, and Jeff, then spreading throw it back on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're doing no, a fantastic right. job. Right. Keep it yeah. up. It's more of a congratulatory <laughs> um, than a, a call to arms. Um, yeah. But no, it, it really is, I think, a group of people working together to not only create the evidence, but to make sure that people understand and know the evidence. And then it's up to the doctors to then tell the parents because they're the ones who are in the real world with the parents. And then as more companies come on board, hopefully with some sort of myopia control indications, they'll better be able to educate parents because they'll, they'll be allowed to educate parents about myopia. Yeah. And those, those studies, which some of them are already done, but we continue to get more and more of them showing refractive errors at different age points, mm -hmm. those becoming part of more mainstream children vision screenings and so forth is going to be a big part of that. Yeah. You mentioned your research, and you're spot on for the way that I think about it. When I read your research, not just the data from your research, but how you, uh, any paper that your name is on, it's something where a, a, a lay optometrist like me can read it and understand what you're doing. I, again, I congratulate you on making it exactly like your target is how do I apply this tomorrow, right? I think about your uh, studies with the biofinity multifocal, right? The D lenses and like that, like I could use that the next day and I love that. And when I go through your research with residents, that's exactly the way that we look at things. So. When I think about your research, it's like, this is stuff I can apply. And many times you are asked, answering questions that I asked the day before or the week before or the month before. So I don't have to do that. What are some things as you're thinking about for the future, either things that studies that are being, being involved right now or questions that are being asked? What are we looking at for the future that you're excited about in the research? Yeah, um, so these aren't even necessarily things that are yet being researched, but I think important questions to answer. There's a lot of controversy about 0.01% atropine right yeah. now. 
A um, lot. Various studies are finding various findings, and so I think it's important for us to know more about how kids in North America are affected by 0.01% atropine, and what is the ultimate concentration of, at of atropine that we need to prescribe. Where's the sort of the maximum amount of, or highest concentration of atropine that we can provide without causing side effects, but still get myopia control. Um, and then along those lines, if we want to apply them to kids before they become myopic, you know, what level can we use for those kids who don't yet get the benefit of myopia control, they basically get an unseen benefit of delaying the onset of myopia. So it's gonna be harder for us to be able to convince them to take eye drops, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there are lots of other areas where we have really important information. We need to know more about outdoor time and why it seems to um, delay the onset of myopia, but it really doesn't affect myopia progression after the onset. So where's the disconnect there? Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a really important question to answer because once we know that, we may be able to provide some of these things. Well, we honestly don't even know what it is about outdoor time. That, right. Um, we got a lot of theories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and they're just that, but that's what we need to start with. So, you know, I think we're making headway there. I think we'll find out more. Um, uh, you know, and um, what, you know, what would be nice for, I think, practitioners is if I have patient with this, this, and this, what's the best treatment for that patient? Sort of what they're doing in cancer, um, they're individualizing the treatment. Yeah. You know, I don't know that we'll ever get there because cancer is caused by a single mutation in a gene generally, and therefore a particular treatment is, ava is available that's best. With myopia, there's multi it's multifactorial, multi-genes involved. So I don't know that we'll get there, but at least we might have a better idea of what would be the, the most likely to be the best treatment for a particular individual. Mm -hmm. So tell me if this crazy harebrained theory makes sense, and this is something that is total recall era, right? So we, in, uh, we somehow are able to have an electronic device that is able to monitor and measure an environment of a child, their screen time, their outdoor time, and we can, you know, like the, the insulin monitors that people are wearing, measure for a two week or a three week period. And, you know, add in the genetic component and add in the refractive error and add in the, you know, parent, all of that. Yeah. I'm curious if someday, maybe not to the genetic level where we are with cancer, but from an environmental, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a parent's perspective on it, that we may be able to get to a little bit through AI a perspective of really narrowing in on it. We've got a lot of go to get there. But. Oh yeah, but I truly believe we're well on our way because all those things exist. You can measure the refractive error of your eye every 10 minutes if you want to yeah. with just a cell phone, not even any attachments mm -hmm. necessary. Um, we can measure a lot of these things with the phone in terms of the environment. Mm -hmm. So I think the next iteration of phones will probably will definitely have the ability to measure outdoor time, yeah. basically. Um, and we're also, they're also able to measure um, working distance. Yeah. Um, so these are features that you can turn on your phone probably today if you update to mm -hmm. the new, newest latest software. So all these things are available. We, like you said, we've got to then put it all together and see if it tells an actual story. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think we're well on our way in terms of some of the technology that's available. Yeah. Just how do we put it all together? Yeah. So, uh, I love that when I talk to you about what are some of the things that are most exciting, you're talking prevention. Mm -hmm. That is not the medical model. The medical model is let's get to the fixing of all of the problems and never talk about prevention, right? But I love that that's where you're excited. What are some other, uh, you know, before as, as we're closing, some other things that are on the horizon, study or no study that are out there that are exciting to you? Well. Before I do that, I want to talk about why I think prevention is sure. important. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's because the reason I think prevention is so important is because we have always thought of myopia as refractive error and we've only treated the symptoms for years. I think people are finally starting to understand that myopia is actually a disease and mm. something that we should do something about 
not only to treat the symptoms, but to actually treat the disease. And we can do that by helping delay the onset of myopia. Yeah. Um, but other things that I think we should think about in general in the future are, you know, is there something that we can do to the eye to keep it from growing? Mm -hmm. Because it's, in theory, it's the stretching of the eye that causes the myopic maculopathies, the big problems that people experience later in the eye. So can we apply something to the sclera to make it more rigid to ultimately decrease eye growth? You know, we then will have to think about what are the ramifications of that because if the eye's growing but it's not getting longer, what does that ultimately change? And does that actually decrease the health ramifications? Yeah. Um, but you know, I think there is, as many things as we can potentially think of in terms of what we could do to try and decrease the problems associated with myopia. You know? um, and so I, I, I honestly almost, I'm not that big of a thinker to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I look for the, the, the immediate problems. I don't look to the huge future. Yeah. So I'm not really good at um, coming up with that big next idea like yeah. the iPhone. But yeah. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I thought Uber was a really stupid idea when I heard about it. So Many people who, who had a chance to invest in Uber did not do it. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I love the aspect of prevention because I continue to hear the excitement in optometry students and recent graduates around treating disease, glaucoma, macular degeneration, retinal issues, and so forth. And I'm saying to myself, Let's get you excited about stopping those issues mm -hmm. before they happen in so many cases and get that to be exciting, not just the fact of the later in life issues that are going to resolve. Yes, we need to take care of people. That's not what I'm saying. We need to take care of people problems with those problems right now. But let's turn down the faucet yeah. a little bit, right, of bringing all of that disease in because it's going to be way worse, you know, oh. 40 years from now uh, if we don't. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we have to tackle it because the prevalence of myopia is going up dramatically. And if we don't do something about it now, the blindness caused by myopia alone mm -hmm. is going to be painful for public health and for individuals. And so, yeah, we've really got to do what we can now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's awesome to talk with you, my man. <laughs> I always learn so much and I have such a good time. Uh, so thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for, for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. Again, we're recording live from the Vision by Design meeting 2023. And we are going to be uh, at next year's meeting, Dallas 2024, October 2nd through the 5th. So make sure to uh, sign up and, uh, and we'll see you there. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thank Team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the Myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. 